<laughs> I hope you enjoyed that delicious lunch. I, I miss the sweets, but I understand they looked beautiful. So again, thank you to our sponsors who uh, made that exceptional lunch uh, possible. So, our, app, our session this afternoon, and I know everybody is ready to go, uh, our session this afternoon will address the issues associated with aligning your library building project with your community needs, the vision of your institution, what you're currently trying to accomplish, and I think the more difficult task, building for the future. Let's start with our first speaker. Colleen Cook is the Dean of Libraries at McGill University, and she's been at McGill since 2011. Prior to McGill, uh, Colleen was the Dean of Libraries at Texas A&M University in the States. We are really fortunate to have Dr. Cook with us today to deliver her talk on the vital role assessment plays in all li library building projects, small, medium, large. Uh, and from the time of inception, through the build, and during post-occupancy. Colleen's research and expertise in library assessment and analysis uh, is her background. She played a leading role in the development and promotion of the LibQual assessment tool, which is used worldwide. She has chaired the IFLA Statistics and Evaluation Committee, as well as American and Canadian Research Library Association committees. Please join me in welcoming Colleen to the podium. Thank you, Diane, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I know that I have um, the pleasure of addressing you about assessment like ho-hum right after lunch and wine. So it's my intention to, um, to keep you entertained a little bit and to teach you just a couple of things, okay? Because as adult learners, you're never gonna go away with more than two or three things from anything. So, um, so let me start out first by um, saying it's only me here. Martha Carilladu is not here. Martha Carilladu is doing the very difficult task of being at another IFLA satellite conference in Samos, uh, Greece. I mean, she is Greek, so maybe that's why she chose to be there. But anyway, I've got some of her slides here, and um, she's helped. And I also really have to say a big thank you to Greg Houston, and you'll see why, because you'll see some of his illustrations. Uh, Greg Houston is a very, I am very fortunate, we are very fortunate at McGill to have him as a very talented member of our staff who helps us with communication work. So, so starting out with assessment, it is inevitable. I mean, you are not going to escape it. You are uh, you will be uninformed, somewhere between uninformed to really stupid if you don't get into assessment. So it starts out with the very beginning. Needs analysis. Do I have enough space? Um, I don't know if y'all have put it together, but Diane and I worked together. And about six years ago, I looked at her and said, is this place really as bad as I think it is? We really need to do something. And she said, Yes, Colleen. So, I mean, that's where it starts out. Advocacy, how do I make my case? Okay, so advocacy is in, I mean, you may have to advocate um, to whomever the decision makers are in your world. For me, at McGill, and I'll talk, I'll, I'm gonna use a couple of examples throughout all of this. I'm gonna be talking about McGill, a large research one university in North America. But I'm also going to be bringing in a couple of very small public library examples. So uh, when I talk about me and, and McGill, um, I am talking about McGill, 
Otherwise, I'm using some of Martha's examples from her recent work with smaller libraries. So advocacy. This was very difficult for us at McGill because I was dealing with a dean of science who will not go by name, who said, you need to just toss all of those three-dimensional objects that are store cases for wood pulp. And then I dealt with the other side of the spectrum, my historians and philosophers who were sure that the Western world as we know it was going to end unless every one of those books stayed on the shelves. And McGill is the only, is one of two Association of Research Library Institutions, the largest 125 or so institutions in North America that do not yet have storage. So, um, yeah. Uh, eventually, we did make our case. Then you have to get into planning. And what services will I offer? We, we must always, always remember that what we are is not bricks and mortar. What we are are the services that we do in, within those bricks and mortar um, walls that, that enhance and allow us to do what we really want to do. And that's to make sure that we engage people and we advance humankind. Uh, um, I'll talk a lot about this. Design, does it fit? I can't tell you how many times recently that I've been dealing with, I love the I, net and square footage. No, net and gross square footage. Unless you get your arithmetic right and everybody knows it and continues to know it and knows where the numbers come from, you will be in the death spiral that I have been living in, which is just pretty awful. You have to make sure that you know what you're talking about with that. And then post-occupancy, does it work? Uh, you have to keep assessing what you're doing because some things are not going to work, some things are. And the only problem that you have with post-occupancy, the worst thing that can happen, the absolute worst thing that can happen is that you, can, you might have to admit that you were wrong and you have to do something differently. And all you got to do is swallow your pride a little bit and everybody will think you were wonderful afterwards that you were that smart enough to do it. And then an ongoing analysis. How do I make it better? How do I keep it relevant? So what I am saying with this is that it is absolutely inescapable for any of you to escape assessment. You can't, you, it's just absolutely impossible to. Do you need to have a PhD to do it? No. I have a PhD. I can do a factor analysis. I can do all this stuff. Uh -uh. But what I am recommending and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is that I am the guerrilla assessment librarian. OK, so this is the assessment person who says, forget Forget all the, I am going to do practical and sustainable assessment for the need that I have right now. If you are not going to generalize to your peers, you don't need to worry about statistical significance testing. What you need is the right data at the right time to get the job done through all of those various phases that I was talking about. And, I mean, we are talking about being very, very, very practical here. So, there has been a theme throughout the morning, and I was very glad to hear it, um, because it's what I was decided I was going to focus on, with this very large topic of assessment. I mean, where do you begin? Where do you end? And so, I decided that I would concentrate on help on insisting that you can't escape as assessment, that it can be very practical, that you need to do it, and that it is terribly important that you engage your users to help you with what you're doing. So don't design anything in an office. 
your, jo your first job with assessment is always to find out, to discern what users want from their viewpoint. Um, because if you don't, you're going to miss the boat. Okay, so how do you do this? You start out with things like town halls. By the way, this little red thing, for those of you who don't know McGill, that's a martlet. That's our, that's our mascot. Okay. So here's the gorilla li uh, assessment librarian sitting at a town hall. Um, we have done multiple town halls at McGill. After we have something to present, we say, here it is, what do you think? Um, what all of the things I'm going to be talking about with these very simple methods are all just plain old garden variety ethnographic research methods that are the heart of qualitative assessment and research. So town halls, listen to people, make sure you get the information recorded and then analyze it. Really important to analyze it because if you don't, you could get the wrong message. Your ears won't do just enough. You have to really look at it and parse it. But it's really important to listen to everybody. So this is, you know, some people aren't too crazy about this, but this is unobtrusive uh, observation. You're sitting there, you're watching, you aren't eavesdropping on what these people are doing. But you're noting, hey, here's a student, they're teaching. It's peer tutoring. This is what's going on in the library. We didn't know it was going on in the library, but it's happening and we need to accommodate that. So it's a sort of very simple thing that you do. This is our guerrilla assessment librarian just doing interviews with lead users. The lead users may be, you know, at McGill it could be someone into, um, into leading physics, uh, particularly medicine, neuromedicine at McGill. But it's as simple as asking them, you know, start out with, I don't care if you're a library user or not. You can't say, how do you use the library? Because what well, if they don't use the library? You say, what's your research? What do you do? Where are you going? And, and parse that. Then you take the information that you have and you put it up on boards and you ask people to vote on it. Here are the services that we've come up with from your perspective. Now, what do you think about it? And you can do that by simple dot voting. And don't forget that little bitty people are participants and users too. So, you know, sit in the story circle and figure out what the kids are actually doing with those books. And you're an observer with that as well. Okay, so this should be a video, but people's videos haven't done that well. I gave up, said we're not doing a video. Okay, so, but this is a time motion video um, at McGill when I had to do one of those basic advocacy things, and this is pure guerrilla assessment librarianship. The deans, some of my best colleagues said, the medical school is up on the hill, and in Montreal, that's kind of a mountain. Medical school is up on a hill. Our students are never down there in the main library. Why would they ever leave us? Snow, ice, horrible winters. And I thought, well, you know, there's no way that um, I can argue with these people. I'll just prove them wrong. I, I like doing that. It kind of makes me feel good when I'm right. Sometimes you'll assess things and find out you're wrong, and you have to admit that too. But so we did a simple census. It was, it was just as, it's a little bit more work than, than this sounds, but you stand at the door, and all of our kids have IDs that show what their department is and what rank of student they are. You just scan their ideas as they come in for eight to 10 hours in your big libraries. And surprise, surprise, we found out, one, that we are absolutely overrun with students. The Edinburgh uh, thing with, you know, they start out with 7,000 students. Now they had 40, uh, that's McGill, our library was built when we had 14,000 students. Now we have 42,000. Uh, um, but what it showed us was that students 
of all disciplines are in all of our libraries every day. We knew that, but we had data that could show it. And I could take that to my colleagues and say, I understand that you're operating from intuition, but your intuition isn't accurate in this. And therefore, won't you support me in helping me build this library? Because your students are using this library as much as anybody else's are. Then once we had gone through a lot of our planning, this is one of the, this is one of those um, uh, voting exercises. Once we had done a lot of our planning and gotten our programs together to put together something called a playbook. A playbook is a, it's a metaphor for a sports play, like football, soccer, whatever. And it's the programs that we would offer. And so we heard from users, and then we went out and we said, is this, of all of these wonderful things that you came up with, what do you want the most? Here are 10 votes, 10 dots, and you can put them on one of these plays. Tell us what you think. We have, um, this is another uh, photo of this. You can see some of the dots. And you can see that community health and wellness is something that got a tremendous number of votes, particularly in McGill, because it's so darn cold. I mean, what people want more than anything is to bring the outside in. That's certainly not going to be the same issue in Rome. But it's terribly important for us. And so what, I, what I'm saying is if you're being a very practical assessment person, Make sure you get the best information you can. Ask people, don't assume anything. Ask them, and ask them over and over again. Same thing, this is undergraduates. So we asked undergraduates, we asked graduate students, we asked faculty, we asked library staff, and surprise, surprise, a lot of it wasn't the same. So then you have to parse that out too. You'll find that library staff is always the hardest on themselves. They don't think they do anything right when in the end our users think they do lots of things right. Okay, so this is what it looks like in the end. Um, just tons and tons and tons of dots. And so you add all that up, you figure out where it's going. These little stickies are, did we really do this right? Those sorts of things, comments. So. This is another kind of um, just plain old, this is all, as I said, there's nothing brilliant about this. You just have to take garden variety, qualitative ethnographic assessment evaluation tools and apply them in a very practical way to your world. So again, this is sitting there with a bunch of ideas that are put on stickies and then how do they group together? They group together like this. You start putting them together into different areas. How can the library best support learning? You put the stickies that apply to that, then they coalesce and you bring them together until you come up with something that makes sense. Same thing here with building placement, specialization. It's a card, typical card sort mentality as well as getting down to the more nitty-gritty of now we have a play that we know that something people want very much, and this is what the individual things look like within that. Okay, so I hope, I've, I, hope I have um, explained to you a little about what, we have, what we're doing at McGill in terms of our project for what will be a renovation and a rebuild of a very... Um, a very large heritage site in the middle of downtown Montreal at the bottom of a mountain. That's kind of a sad story. You're supposed to feel sorry for me with that, but um, anyway. So let me turn a little bit to how you can take these very same tools in a very small public library setting. And recently, the Institute for Museums and Library Services in the United States um, had a series of grants that were given to 15 very small public libraries um, under a program called Small Libraries Design Smart Spaces. 
And these were very, very small libraries. Uh, um, I mean, teeny tiny little li libraries. For instance, the Milton Public Library in Wisconsin. If you're as bad at geography as I am, you see where it is, thought you'd want to do that. The, again, this active learning is um, uh, having people understand that what we're trying to do is um, fulfilling a key role of providing informal learning for the community by working with your co community to co-design a space with a goal of participatory active learning and strengthening social connections. So again, it's trying to involve your users in designing a very small space. Again, it involves everybody. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But this is, this is um, a participant's quote from this process. The concept of an active learning space inspired me to review all of our floor space to ensure that it is actively used throughout the day, not just reserved for special audiences at certain times of the day. Also asking the community to get involved in co-creating space was a win-win for us. And we will utilize this community buy-in perspective with all future projects. Outcomes and benefits. They put, um, at Milton Public Library, they put, to get, put together a business focus area for agriculture with the, with the goal of enhancing economic and employment development in this little teeny tiny town. These are the people who were involved in a fundraiser for it. As you're building advocacy, you're also uh, building your capacity for fundraising because people feel that they've been involved. And the same thing can happen in, um, this is, I have to admit, this was inspired by Martha, who's Greek and American, but anyway, so. A uh, little library in Greece, the Kalambaka Library, did very similar things in renewing and redesigning their children's area. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly um, because there's some floor plans here and um, having seen lots of floor plans this morning, I think we're just about floor planned out. But you can see how um, involving your users and your community in a project is absolutely essential, and you do that through simple ethnographic models and the tools of a guerrilla assessment librarian. So this is the original layout. This is phasing, this is weeding, they move the train around for different programs, they've got space to, to redo their, they redid their children's area, it's much more logical now. So, questions? Thank you. For a few questions. Anything from the floor? Yes, Karen. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm a great advocate of post-occupancy evaluation, as some of the people in this room who know me know, and I absolutely agree with you. You need the data to see how it works, and I also agree that it can be scary because you might be proved wrong on some things. But what is the real concern, I think, is that you're probably brave enough to admit you're wrong. We as librarians are probably brave enough. But the people who've given you the money, and this is what the universities are usually scared of, don't really want to hear any criticism of their new X million pound building. So how do you bring them, and the architects very often, architects in the room, are, can be, I mean, you do, you do a far more post-occupancy than we do, but mainly about sort of sustainability and energy use and things. And I just wonder, how do you sell that to the people who only want to hear good things about your building. Uh, um, okay, I don't have any true words of wisdom in that. I have, I see that as a management and an um, an advocacy issue. So, um, I would you, I personally would use humor and um, and just some appealing to their better nature in. We wanted to make sure that your money was being used in the right way. So we're going to stretch every dollar, and we're going to make sure that we do it right. And so we're going to do, we're going to stop doing this, and we're going to start doing that. And then if that doesn't work, I do the same thing over and over and over again, probably over a lot of wine. 
Uh, <laughs> any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Great. I'll just do my, my intro here, and then we'll get the slides lined up. Thank you, Colleen. Our next speaker, Marianne Mavernack, is the Vice Provost and Dean of the University of Rochester Libraries uh, since 2012. As a fellow Canadian, uh, Marianne was the Chief Librarian at the University of Toronto Mississauga Library prior to joining the University of Rochester in 2012. At both Rochester and in Toronto, uh, Marianne has been a leader in developing award-winning academic library spaces and transforming not just the space, but the services in those spaces. Her interest and research focus on library as place, leadership, and mentoring. Marianne is currently serving as the past president of ARL, the Association of Research Libraries in North America, and today, Marianne's talk will speak to the importance of anchoring and aligning library building practices. Please welcome Marianne. I'm going to, I might need, uh, I might need Corrado in about six seconds. Yeah, just a sec. Corrado, I'm, I'm, oh, here we go. Okay. Where are you? Right there. This one. The yeah. one with your name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. And there we go. Great. Thank you, Marianne. Thanks a lot, Diane. And thank you to Mimi and Diane for inviting me to come today. It's a real delight. And thank you for your, uh, your attention. Um, so I'm uh, excited to uh, share with you some of the things that I've um, experienced in terms of anchoring and aligning one's project uh, to the institutional, to the library, and most important, to the user needs. A lot of what I'm saying you've heard this morning already. Um, I'm going to bring it together, hopefully, pull it together and take it sort of to, to sort of a principle level. So I, hopefully you can walk away with X number of principles that will contribute to success in your building projects. The projects that I'm going to be talking about are fairly small in the grand scheme of things. Uh, they're not brand new libraries, they're spaces within an existing library. So, um, anchor and align. Strategies for success require really an integrated uh, approach that we're anchoring and aligning and within all kinds of planning documents and planning initiatives in your library. Well, I'm talking about an academic research library. These will hold for public libraries as well, and school libraries, you just switch you know, the names and, uh, of the community. But really, these, these go for, for any which way. Libraries really do not exist on their own. Um, they are not untethered. Um, they really speak to their community and the needs of their community. And we really, in order to have a long-term success of whatever we do, we really have to really add value and support, in our case, the teaching, learning, and research mission of the university. So what we did was we embedded um, library spaces in a number of planning initiatives. And one being, uh, in 2014, we did a master plan of our main library, which is called the Rush Rees Library. This has held us in incredibly good um, um, uh, uh, space. Because uh, what it did, and it's been pivotal to our success, is it tackled a building, and as an earlier speaker said, for us, 1930 is a relatively old building. Um, it tackled this building in terms of really some sort of orientation for the long term. And it's been pivotal to our success. And really to evolve the theme of this conference, evolve this space to be relevant for the 21st century, because it certainly wasn't doing that. So this master plan as well um, really protected us because anybody that works anywhere with libraries, li a space is the final frontier. 
I mean, people are after your spaces all the time, especially at universities, you're often locked within a, a, a defined area. And if you don't really have a plan, a long-term plan, um, you may be, um, you know, um, poached, so to speak, uh, with other, with other uh, units that want to come into the library. And this has held us in really good stead, is to have this master plan. So we follow this plan. You don't do a master plan and don't follow it. So the master plan was really to provide a roadmap for the transformation of our library for a state-of-the-art art research library. We were hoping to, to go out you know, another, hopefully, 100 years. We connected with the university's strategic plan, and we identified a lot of things that weren't working in the library, and we want to set out to fix them. It was hard to navigate through the library. People were lost upon entering it, and this uh, serves to fix things as we go on. And because we don't have buckets of money, we actually, in this plan, have a series of discrete projects that we can effect over the long term. So what we did was we um, really defined, just like a city's master plan, we defined, you know, like something like green space, high density for department, uh, uh, commercial. In our sense, it was general learning or specialized learning, staff space, collections, specialized collections, and we just followed that. So we didn't know exactly what program and service would go in some areas of the master plan, but we did know that we would stay with that major planning um, area. Another anchoring is to anchor library space in your vision. Um, if you want to be serious about it, you really should include it in your vision. And this is our current vision. We aspire with our unique and diverse expertise, collection, and spaces, we feel like we have a unique value proposition for the university, and we provide transformational experiences to our students and faculty for their achievement of scholarly aspirations. So we put it right in our vision. We also are aligning it with our master plan, uh, sorry, our strategic plan. Our strategic plan has five priorities, and one of them is library spaces, and we call it enabling spaces. So this plan is from 20 18 through to 2025, and we're indicating what we're going to be working on through this period. Str strategic priorities should be very um, large so that you have a lot of room within them to do something a little more specific. So you don't want to lock yourself in, but nonetheless, library spaces is, is within our strategic plan. You want to align with university priorities um, and community priorities for a public library. So in our case, the university was, is a very much a STEM, a, a, a science, medical, engineering, um, technology, I got the order wrong, university, and it has a very active humanities faculty. The university wanted to um, basically en um, enhance the humanities by demonstrating the importance of the humanities in all instruction. And they were looking for a place to house the Humanities Center. Because we had our master plan and we had a large area for specialized learning, we offered to give that space to the university. And we embedded within it our digital scholarship lab, which got paid for um, this new space within the Humanities Center. So we leveraged a university priority and we, um, nothing's wrong with uh, helping the university out because you really want to be a partner and it's really brought um, humanists back into the library because we're actually a, a laboratory for the humanities. So we also are aligning, we have to raise money, that was mentioned a few times this morning, uh, with our advancement plan, which is our fundraising plan. So we, this is our current uh, plan. We have a couple of projects on the go for the summer of 2020, and I'll mention them a little later on. But these are our advancement priorities. So fundraisers and myself raise money for these areas. But our space planning is right in our advancement priorities. Again, we're aligning with our, our planning documents. Another thing, another principle is really fundamental, and Colleen mentioned this in, in, a, in a strong sense. Programs and services drive space. It's not the other way around. By doing a renovation and not knowing what you're really doing, but, but really, as we say, moving things around, it's, it's not something that's um, speaking to or um, basically addressing user needs. So basically, it's not, the, 
if you build it, they really won't come, actually, because you're not responding to what the community needs. So we really want to ensure that um, our uh, plans really drive uh, what our, our users are want, and our, and our projects will be much more successful. We started one of our projects a few years before. We started analyzing our um, access services, which is circulation services, and our reference services. And we went through a really big planning exercise. How would we do these services differently? And then we designed the space around it. And we talked to our users and um, basically you know, found out what was needed. And we actually also piloted the new services in the old space. I think this is essential. Have as much lead time as, as possible, develop your service model and then pilot it because it may not work and you can tweak it. And then when you get to the library design, you have a lot more to say about what the functional elements should be. It's um, again, I think very essential to the success of what you're doing. So here's the new service model in um, action in uh, this space. So the space has been transformed we do a lot in this space. We don't have a reference desk anymore. We call it research consultations, and our libraries, librarians are out doing very personal interactions with, with our students and with our faculty. We do what's called pop-up programming. You know, in libraries, most people don't really know what a library is. I mean, come in and be surprised. Uh, so for us, we do pop-up programming to expose uh, to our students, our collections. We expose some of the research they do. They do uh, programming in this space. We show new technology, um, and uh, we do a lot of things that really, um, but the space is purpose-built to do this. Engaging users, to pick up a lot on what Colleen said, engaging users is absolutely essential. Um, it really, even naysayers, naysayers will sharpen our vision, they will sharpen our narrative, and we really have to talk to not just people that like what you're doing, but people that don't like what you're doing, because you really should analyze, I mean, where you're going and, you know, why you're doing it. And like I say, they do help the project. Projects take a lot of time, so bear that in mind. One project I'm going to share with you, the very first meeting of it started in August 2013, and the uh, project opened in August 2018. And it wasn't that big a project, but it, it took five years. Five years of user engagement, five years of raising money, five years of user research, and five years of building community. It was pivotal in 2014 where it says SA passes resolution to support IDEA. SA is the Students Association. They loved this project and they put themselves behind it, so they were advocating for us. So as I mentioned, user research is essential, and Colleen went through a lot of user research methods. We used most of those. Um, but they build commun community and they build momentum. You don't want to leave people behind. So we worked with, um, in our case, uh, Bright Spot um, strategies, and over a five to six month period, we were planning a project, a program called iZone. iZone is innovation, imagination, and ideas. And it is really to inspire early exploration of ideas for social, cultural, community, and economic benefit. So we found out what our users wanted, and then we built the program. Prior to getting in the space, as I mentioned, we did a lot of piloting and prototyping. So we tested things out. What didn't work, we put aside. And we do this now all the time. We don't fall in love with a program. You know, a program isn't meant to be around for the next 10 years or the next 20 years. I mean, if it works for six, to, six months to a year, great, but you should always be assessing that program and finding out if it works or not. So we did a lot of that building, uh, piloting, and prototyping, and it informed our, our project. And we do ongoing stakeholder engagement. So we, in iZone in this case, we just said, vote for this. What do you think of these programs? Which, what should we be doing? It builds engagement, it builds support, it builds community. So, another principle. Vision inspires supporters. It inspires um, excitement, it inspires um, 
a sense of really, I want to come on board with this project. I want to help it out. And it's students, it's faculty, in our case, it's alumni, in your case, it's community. At the Evans Lamb Square um, dedication, that was that space that was completely transformed to the new services. Evans Lamb, you can see him there, he looks like a really happy man right now. We're dedicating the space in his honor, and he was listening to a talk I gave on our master plan. And he said to me, you educated me. I didn't know what a modern research library was about. He then decided to support this project, and to this day, I mean, he's put us in his bequest. I mean, he, he is a trustee of the university, and he basically is advocating for our funding. He is a supporter because we had a compelling vision that he wanted to fall behind. For iZone, um, Barbara J. Berger, she is also a trustee. And when she saw that we had done user research, she read the whole 60-page report. She was very interested in what a, um, an academic research library would be in the 21st century. What are the kinds of things that we would evolve that concept of the library to be? She felt we did our homework, she felt we had a vision, and she supported us um, for um, a donation of $1.2 million. And then other supporters came along. So, success beget, uh, begets success, another principle. You do your homework, you do your research, you are constantly iterating, you have successful projects you're noticed, you have credibility. So iZone, this is a shot of the um, space that opened in August of 2018. We have a lot of people that are coming to see this project from around the world. And also, you know, the dean of the business school. Um, we've win won awards and um, we've really built credibility around, you know, how we can do learning spaces and how successful they are. So that then works into, we're on to the next project. What I suggest is that you always have one or two projects that are ready to go. And uh, the couple of projects that I mentioned in our fundraising plan, we have a large 24-hour space that was opened in 20, 2007, and for 12 years it's been used 24 hours a day. It is really um, used and beaten up. And this project we're working on for the summer of 2020. We're not going to fundamentally change what it is, but we've done a ton of user research to get this project in shape. Another project that we're working on is we, uh, when the University of Rochester put a strategic priority around augmented and virtual reality. There's over 60 researchers working in this area. Our credibility was such that the deans of the faculties knew that we could really um, come home with a project that would be successful to provide an easy on-ramp for students and faculty to learn these technologies, these immersive technologies. So in the summer of 2020, we finished our user research, we finished our design and vision charrettes, and this project will occur in the summer of 2020. This is momentum. We don't have the money yet, actually, but we have to be bold. You have to be audacious which is actually my next point. Aim high. Why would you aim low? Success is having that um, confidence that you, know, you can deliver fantastic projects. So think big. You never know really where it's going to go, as long as you have realistic steps along the way. This master plan I talked about is an $80 million project. We finished five, five, five projects already for this master plan in just about four years. So we ha we're nowhere near $80 million, but it's, it's a momentum, it's a confidence thing, it's a credibility thing, and it's a coherent, integrated plan. So we really hope to do this knowledge gallery, which is going to reimagine our library stacks to do object-based experiential learning with our rare and unique items. This is our aspiration, we're aiming high. And we also know that this library has a 100th anniversary in 2030, so we're already talking about a major capital, which is a fundraising campaign for the 100th anniversary. That should bring some dollars in, hopefully, that will help this uh, master plan. So in 
um, closing, this is me in my happy place. Um, I'll just summarize. Anchor and align your plans within the, the community, the library, the university, so that it makes sense with what your community is all about. Develop innovative programs and services, then design your spaces after you've done the user research that's going to inform what these spaces should all be about. Engage your stakeholders in this user research that will build community and inform that project. And have a compelling vision that creates excitement and engages even the naysayers. And finally, aim high, be audacious, and success hopefully will beget success. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary Ann. <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, do we have uh, we have a few moments before our next speaker? Love to have some questions if you'd like to drill down a little further. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. Great presentation. Thank um, you. you talked about uh, uh, the services, new services, and sort of testing them out in the old uh, uh, space. And then if it doesn't work, scrap it. Uh, what do you measure on if it to, uh, to see if it works or doesn't work? What are the things you measure on? Well, we do assessment for one thing. I mean, it could be as simple as nobody came, like if it's a program. Um, it could be that it was a real um, struggle to even do the program. Um, it could be user feedback. Uh, we do do, we will often do very short um, feedbacks um, right after. And in fact, a lot of our programming, we ask our students to swipe in and then we ask them, if part of them being there is to answer those questions. Um, so those are some of the things that we do. And you can, you can get a good feel for things that aren't working and you can get a great feel for things that are working. So we just keep, um, keep adjusting them. And sometimes we just don't do it. It's not working. In fact, Evans Lamb Square, we still have not rolled out the entire service plan. Um, it's, it's actually more difficult to change um, library staff behavior. So that's been slower. Let's not get into that topic. <laughs> That'll be a whole conference session. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm really curious if you could identify what the factors are that have brought you to be able to have such a risk-taking risk approach. I think a lot of libraries would have directors who would be very risk-averse, and in my experience, that's quite a big cultural shift to get to a place where you can say, yes, we screwed up. Right. And not so, be... You yeah. Know, I know, and I, I don't consider, and, I, and it's not all me, it's our, it's our wonderful staff. Let me get that out there. But I don't consider myself a particularly risky person. I think it's, it's really bound up in doing a lot of the user research. Like, we did not do anything for iZone uh, before we did a town hall, for instance, and heard that people really wanted it. And the, then we kept citing those people and building it and, and talking to the naysayers. But yeah, when I look back, I think, oh, that was a little bit audacious. And I think I'm, you know, it's almost like I blink after the fact a little bit. So um, I think if you do things, there's probably other principles, but I thought about what, what really are the contributing principles to successful projects. And I think if you stay with at least these, I think that it will um, result in these more possibly risky things. Like iZone, for instance, the first two years, all I ever answered was, why would you put an innovation space in the library? Like it was just, what are you doing? So I had to define, refine what I call the narrative. And I said, libraries since time immemorial, like the Alexandrian Library, have been places where people come together discuss ideas, and create knowledge. iZone is a 21st century expression of this. And all of a sudden, people stop talking. But it took me a while to get that narrative in a really crisp, as they say, elevator speech. So a lot of it comes with, you know, getting dissenters and people saying, I don't get this, I don't, and, and then you have to, like Colleen say, says, you have to admit you're not communicating it well. 
and we're not communicating it well, and figure out, okay, and it's not a form of manipulation, it's really, okay, people aren't getting this. And then now, we're, we're flooded and uh, with, with uh, people using that space, and, and, it, and it makes sense, but it takes time to do that. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Please join me in thanking you for a very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are extremely fortunate today to have Carolyn Robertson, Head of Libraries and Information at the Taronga Public Library in Christchurch, New Zealand. Carolyn leads the planning, development, and delivery of public library services for the citizens of Christchurch. Most of us in this room have been involved in planning services and projects of varying shapes and sizes at our own institutions, but very few of us have had to deal with the aftermath of a natural disaster such as the one experienced in Christchurch following the deadly earthquake in 2011. From the rubble, Award-winning library and service models were developed and a community has been transformed. I'm really looking forward to hearing Carolyn's presentation. Please welcome Carolyn Robertson. Now, you're Taronga. Uh, yeah, that's okay, right. good. <laughs> it's, it's getting easier. It's getting easier. <laughs> Should be a second. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Uh, hello and welcome, three times welcome uh, to everyone uh, from Christchurch, New Zealand. It's wonderful to be here today. Thank you to Jan for inviting me, having the opportunity. And uh, thank you for everybody for such a rich and interesting learning experience. Just so many things. This is a good thing about talking at this time of the day. You know, Pretty much everyone said something that you wanted to say, but also so many things resonate. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm just um, honoured to be talking to you, giving you an overview about Turanga, uh, which is our new central library, and um, just uh, talking a little bit about some of the key elements in the transformation. And I've got paper notes because I set myself the challenge of not having lots of words on the screen, so bear with me if a bit of paper gets moved around. So uh, this looks like a lovely pastoral scene, doesn't it? Uh, this, is, um, this is the Avon River in Christchurch. Uh, in, um, such as the largest city in the South Island of New Zealand. It's a population of just under 400,000 people. And our library service is the largest public library service in the South Island. And second, um, second only to Auckland, which is a very big public library service in New Zealand terms. And my colleague Louise is here today too from Auckland, which is in the North Island. Uh, we have 20 libraries, including the new central library and a mobile service. And um, yes, we have Probably I won't go into a lot of stats. I might just tell you that we've just had our, our 160th birthday. So um, we, um, given the, the relative newness of, um, of, of New Zealand um, from the post-colonial period, uh, a library was set up, a Mechanics Institute library was set up very early in Christchurch's um, European history. <clears throat> so uh, as has just been mentioned, uh, we had a big event uh, back in 2011. Uh, Thank you, thank you, sorry, I do tend to talk quickly, thank you for that. Um, but just before I, um, well, yes, just to, in talking about that, the former Central Library was opened in the 1980s. It had been extended twice, and by 2004, it was too old and just not fit for purpose. We couldn't do the, run the services and programs that we wanted to. So following that devastating um, earthquake in, in uh, Christchurch and our region Canterbury, uh, in 2010 and 11, uh, the, much of the central city was destroyed. Uh, a lot of buildings just flattened, gone. Um, the, the CBD was, or Central Business District was closed uh, for quite a period of time, including, guess what, our central library. Uh, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't demolished immediately, and initially we thought that this, our city council would rebuild it. Uh, they thought it was possible to, to repair and, or rebuild, um, but that's not how things developed, and I'll tell you about that. So in this image that you've got here at the top, uh, that was the day um, in February 2011 uh, when we had a 6.4 earthquake, fairly shallow, um, immediately under the city. 
Uh, so that's, that was the smoke that was rising up. Um, there's an image there of our former central library and also uh, a picture in that other corner of um, the process of demolition of that building about a year later. So um, picking up on the points about prototyping and piloting, uh, we operated, we had no choice but to operate uh, temporary central library services from much smaller uh, locations, at least space, uh, in one in the north of the city and one in the south uh, for pretty much seven, seven to eight years um, after that earth, uh, the devastating earthquake. Uh, what, so they were much more like community or branch libraries than a central library, uh, but they did have um, the services, some of the specialist collections and staff and what services we could bring. And um, interesting, thinking about piloting, um, it gave us an opportunity to try some new things, do things differently, quite simply because we couldn't um, provide what we had before. We had, we had to think outside the square. So how did we get from the images that you see here uh, to this, our new library? And this is a montage of two, two images, I have to say, just in case it looks a bit confusing. Turanga is our new five-storey, 9,850 square metre library in Christchurch's historic Cathedral Square. So this is a, this is a different site from the one we had before. And it was um, designed uh, in, in collaboration between Architectus, a New Zealand firm, and Schmidt Hammer Larsen, the Danish firm, who did Dock One and a number of other libraries. First time the two, they had partnered together. And what, what our aspiration was, and what we think we've achieved, is a library that's a vibrant public space that strengthens the community, advances literacy and lifelong learning, celebrates diversity of culture and heritage, and draws people back into the city centre. And that was an absolutely key element. In fact, pretty much a mandate from the central and local government for, for this library to be an anchor that drew people back and attracted them in, in a city centre that was just changed utterly. Okay, so um, just to give you a little sense of, um, oh, yeah, of the, this is, I, I kind of don't really think about this, but just how much was lost. Um, in fact, in the, just below the circle, which was our site, is um, the cathedral, so this is the Anglican Cathedral, in Cathedral Square, which is the geographic and symbolic heart of the city, uh, which is still in a state of, um, of, um, yeah, major damage, and it's, it has been uh, like this since the earthquakes. It has now been, uh, while, it, while the church and the city and the community decided whether to rebuild it or not. So um, it's, it's a constant reminder for us of that, that rebuild. Um, but, um, so things look very different now, but just to point out that so our, our central library um, was there in the, just bordering the cathedral, uh, and there would also be a perform there is going to be a performing arts precinct, and a convention centre and a rebuilt um, town hall. So that's really uh, the, the, the context or the setting. Uh, one city councillor described our new site as being uh, the best address in town. So uh, that was, we, we could, but, could but agree. So, and we, we've heard this message a lot um, so far today about thinking big and, and being bold and taking risks. Uh, and this is a quote from our mayor, um, Mayor Leanne Dalzell. Uh, and she said, we're not just rebuilding the central library, we are reinventing it, changing what the word library actually means for people. Uh, she said, you could say it's a reimagined library for a reimagined Christchurch, a place filled with knowledge, technology and new experiences. So the bar was set quite high. Uh, we had a mandate to be bold and take risks, terrifying but good fun too. And uh, the, Hearing from the community, uh, again a theme, uh, really understanding what people uh, wanted uh, before. So our designers were, um, had been awarded the contract for, for doing the design uh, and our council said before the designers pick up their pencils, I don't know if, if architects use pencils now, but um, we want to hear from the community and this was exactly what we wanted to do too. As people have said, we really needed that buy-in and engagement. I won't read all that out, you can see it. We ran a campaign uh, with very little funding and in a very short period of time. Um, but we, we had, we, and we used all sorts of, um, uh, all sorts of survey um, methods that have been described today and, and, uh, and an online um, um, tool as well. 
and got, got some really great engagement. And I know it's not a very good photo, uh, but there's a picture at the bottom there of two school children. We talked a lot with children, not exclusively, of course, but we really had great engagement from local schools. And they presented their ideas to the mayor and councillors about what they wanted from their library. Probably no surprises in there, but uh, this really was um, the Your Library, Your Voice feedback really informed uh, the thinking, uh, both for the library team and the design team. And of course we did a lot of stakeholder um, workshops as well. And um, I was just thinking about this before, so we ran multiple workshops with, with key partners, existing partners, um, people we wanted to partner with, um, um, business community, those that we hadn't perhaps had strong enough relationships with in the past as well. Um, so education and technology, yes, and our, um, certainly working with um, Māori, um, very much so. Um, but we also reached out to, to some that we didn't have strong relationships with, and, and that was good. Some tough conversations. I wouldn't say we liked everything we heard, but again, as be, has been described to us, that was really, really good to challenge our own thinking. And I think we, um, and picking up on a point that was made before, we really thought hard about what we wanted to be better and different from our old central library. I don't want you to think that was kind of looking at it from the glass half empty, but it was a really good opportunity to think about that. And also to incorporate those successful pilots and, um, and innovations that we had been, um, I guess, had come up with, both with our temporary services and also as we were redesigning, we were also rebuilding community, a number of community libraries that had been damaged or destroyed by the earthquakes. So that, it was a lot of work, but it, it was really very stimulating to think about how we could incorporate some of those into the new library. So just to give you a, a better sense than that diagram um, before, um, this is the site, so there's Turanga in the foreground, um, site borders Cathedral Square, as I said, uh, and the, the, the city behind, and then the port hills, local hills in the distance. So that's looking south um, to, towards the nearby hills. Very, very important aspect for the design uh, was the strong visual connection to the natural landscape. It's really fundamental, and it's both something that the community said was really important to them to have that strong connection. And local Māori, our, um, our iwi or tribe, Naitahu, uh, they were very influential in drawing on cultural reference points, very symbolic um, places in the, in the natural environment. Uh, and as they are mana whenua, or people of our land, uh, we, it was utterly key to work closely in partnership with them. And that led on to the development of a cultural narrative, uh, which was um, centred on the notion of mataranga mana whenua, the body of knowledge that connects and relates to the people of the land of this place. And the, their cultural values and aspirations and narratives and stories were woven holistically into the conceptual development of the architecture and the spaces right from the very um, early work with the concept design and it's carried all the way through. And some of the examples, if you think, what does that actually mean? Uh, it, it, it's the views that the building affords, uh, it's the terraces and openings on the upper floors linked to that landscape, both the immediate cityscape and the wider hills and mountains beyond. And in this image you've got um, the golden facade of the building, uh, which you've seen in, in some pictures already, was inspired by the colours and folds of the Port Hills, uh, which has a, a tussock, and as well as the angular forms of the flax, or harakiki as it's known in Māori, which is native to central Christchurch, which is built on a swamp. So, yeah, just to give you an idea, we feel, and we've done a little montage there of that facade on the building to hopefully give you an idea of how that's reflected from the, those natural forms. And this is also carried through into artwork. Um, so the inclusion of that integrated design, artworks, and bilingual signage um, translates that traditional mataranga or knowledge into contemporary form and really adds, I think, a, a richness and a, a kind of soul to, to the experience of being in the building. Uh, there are five integrated artworks commissioned by local um, Māori artists, four of which are shown here. And the name Turanga speaks of the whakapapa or ancestry across the generations and evokes the connection with the North Island of New Zealand and to the wider Pacific. Uh, Turanga is celebrated in a depiction on the western facade, and that's that bottom, um, the carving on the bottom image there. 
There was also a dual language approach to signage and wayfinding. So we've worked very, very closely with our Māori partners to develop that. So what about services? And how does the, uh, how does the cultural narrative actually, and, and Māori knowledge systems, translate and become a part and integrate with our, our, I guess, our library culture? So one of the things that, in planning our new service model, we defined how we wanted to work uh, and establish a philosophy that would take us forward. Uh, we started with a service philosophy, just a general service philosophy, service philosophy, and then we said, well, it's got some bicultural elements, so we, that's what we're currently calling it. I think we'll probably just call it our way of working. I think that's evolving. Um, but what it does express, or what we've tried to capture, is our traditional Māori values and knowledge systems. So um, you can see in that diagram there, um, they're represented by whanaungatanga, uh, which is relationships, kinships, and working together. Māramatanga, which is knowledge, enlightenment and understanding. Kaitiakitanga, which is about guardianship. So caring for our, obviously our collections, our resources, our staff and our environment. And manakitanga, so everyone has mana and everyone is respected. So these values both influence and are reflected in our behaviours uh, with our library users, uh, with our colleagues, uh, with our partners. And the central message uh, that we will find a way to help is is, is core to, to the thinking. And if you think, well, this is, these, thing, these things are fine as a bit of paper that you develop at the time, what I can tell you is this has really become a very live and active um, approach with our staff. They have absolutely embraced this. And they talk, we talk about living, living, our, um, the, living our service philosophy and our values. So what about people? Uh, here's a, a shot on the, on the central stairs of a good number of our staff um, just before opening. Uh, we actually had recruitment became a very large and scary uh, prospect. Uh, we had to, and I guess that was a focus from early, probably early 2017, um, we had created a service philosophy, we had created new positions and a new structure. What we knew, we had to bring on over 70 new people. So we had the, um, the staff, the remaining staff from our old central library. Uh, many people had been, had, some people had left the city, left libraries, had different jobs after the earthquakes. Um, seven to eight years is a long period of time. Um, those who remained worked in our uh, temporary central libraries and we needed to do a major bit of recruitment. And we were really worried about where we were going to get people from. This was, this was you know, we thought this, is, this could go bad, very badly. I had nightmares about this sort of thing. Um, but we actually uh, were very successful. We really had to rethink, though, how we were going to recruit. And uh, a game changer for us was to employ uh, um, somebody who had a lot of experience from the a National Probation Service. Uh, she brought um, some really good methodology and also really helped to, she really challenged us to, to be very open and transparent uh, to ensure that we got the right people, obviously, um, but we, she really helped us to develop our, improve our capability with recruitment. And there's a lot in that, and I'm just glossing over it. But we do believe that we've got a, a wonderful team of uh, bright, engaged, very enthusiastic people. We've got people in different roles from some of our traditional library roles, and that's fantastic and we've got a really successful integration with our existing staff. And training, obviously. So once you've got the new people on board, what are you going to do with them? Uh, we developed learning and development plans for all the roles and, and individualised training plans for the staff who, had, who were moving into new roles, existing staff. We ran lots of induction um, programs and all the new staff were assigned to a home library to embed their learning from induction until the new library opened. Uh, Specialised training events were prepared to help to, for staff working in Turanga, such as an introduction to the technologies, to working with partners, to hosting events and programs on a scale that, that we hadn't done before. And there was a team building day for each floor prior to opening fabulous fortnight, which was an um, ob obvious period of time, familiarisation period, and also a passport to Turanga, which was a kind of scavenger hunt to get people familiar. Another key aspect to, to transforming our services was the development of signature programmes. So yes, of course, we had our regular programmes, our literacy based programmes and technology programmes, but we really thought hard about what, we, what did we need to do differently. 
And uh, quite a lot of this was really about promoting that we wanted everyone to come in and use the library. As has been said many times today, it's about this really conveying very powerfully that this is a place for everybody to be welcome. So we wanted the community to run their own events. Uh, we wanted to um, host lots of different kinds of uh, programs to, uh, to test what would work for ourselves and, and really work closely with our partners. Um, to, to, so that collaboration and co-design of programs and events was really key. So there won't be anything in there, I'm sure, that you haven't done or are planning to do, but it was really, for us, I guess, it was about how do we lift the bar with what we had done in the past. And just a, a few examples of anything from an author talk to, to cultural programs. Lots of wonderful celebration from, from different, um, different cultures within Christchurch. And just on to, on to partners, uh, so we have a number of partners on that, that um, image, um, particularly our founding partners, just picking up on the, the points about fundraising. We did 101 on, on um, partnering and, um, and bringing in external funding, which um, looking back we were complete novices at. Um, it was something that initially we thought central government was going to lead and then we found out a couple of years later that no, our library team would be leading that, thank you very much. And I, I, I love the point um, that we heard just before about changing the narrative and, and communicating and compelling in different ways. Thank you, that was absolutely. We started off, I think, very much uh, talking about it from the, outs from the inside out, from a very much a library perspective, rather than what would our partners benefit. What would, um, we knew what the community would benefit to some degree, but we really needed to develop that proposition. And um, just the use of the word library, we've heard a bit about that today too. Uh, we, had, um, we had a lot of reaction from corporate part prospective corporate partners that they loved the look of, the, uh, of, of this new facility, but it's not a library. Um, so it said, it looks great, but that's not a library. That's not what libraries are about. So we had to work hard at that. And it, that was good for us too. Uh, so our three found founding spark partners, Spark, TSB and Southbase, support education, information sharing and community engagement opportunities. Uh, they have this naming rights for some of the high profile spaces in the building. And we're really working on that leverage program uh, to make sure that we are really getting win-wins for them and for, for libraries and council. And we also have community partnerships too, building on what we had in place before. Uh, and um, that's yeah, around technologies and, and learning through play particularly. So just a, a, perhaps a, I think a little, just to before I is, is finishing up or just um, taking you on a little tour, um, through the building, and we saw some images earlier on. Um, but I just really want to talk to you about the, um, the central stair, the staggered staircase, um, social staircase for gathering, reading, and resting. Uh, the design of the atrium and that um, statue that you can see there, that references uh, Tafaki, who is a demigod from ancestral Maori traditions, and his determined pursuit of knowledge as he climbs up through the heavens. So a fairly lofty aspiration there. Each of the five floors has a theme, and I'll just quickly take you through those. So the ground floor is He Hononga, which is about connection. It invites people to enter, to browse the magazines and new material. We really like to just have showcasing new material, not a lot of collection at all on the ground floor. And um, creating a strong connection to the streetscape. There is an innovation zone and a large multi-purpose meeting space. And there's also, you can see there in that image on the, the bottom, uh, the dis what we call the discovery wall, which is a three metre long digital touch wall that represents Christchurch. And it's a cityscape, digital cityscape, made up of images from our photo and video collections uh, and our archives. Uh, so to date, we've got about 9,000 images lo loaded on the wall and it's growing. It has its own website and I'm happy to um, share information if anyone's interested. And we've had about 20 million touches on the wall so far. So it's exciting, a lot of interest and really helping people to connect with the, the heritage of their city. So level one is Hapori, uh, which is the community floor. Uh, you've, you can see in the, in the foreground there are lots of large Lego bricks. Um, there's lots of small Lego bricks as well. Uh, that is a partnership with Imagination Station, who are an independent charity, so they are, they've, they've got space in the building, um, but they run their own programs and activities, um, educational play through using Lego. 
So this is the family floor um, where people can come together for events and programs, play and craft, children's collections, teens. Um, it's, it's, we've got a real focus on supporting children's development and well-being, encouraging and stimulating literacy, learning and innovation, and, yeah, and digital literacy, of course. Uh, there's a storytelling drum with a slide and reading cave. Quite a few adults squeeze themselves into that. And an interactive fish tank using augmented reality. So it's a, it's a fun space. It's also a double height space and um, pretty much it's glass on three sides. And the whole idea with that is that it's very visual, um, very, very obvious from the outside as well as great to look out from inside. And there's the, uh, this is our TSB space, which is our, um, which is our performance, one of our large performance spaces. So being used very, very heavily, which is great. And we wanted flexibility. We talked about that this morning. That was really key here. So level two is our identity. Tuakiri is our identity floor. This is Christchurch and Canterbury Heritage Collections, uh, Māori and Pacifica um, material, and uh, archives. So this is right in the heart of the building, if you like. We have our heritage area. And we've also got just a small bespoke exhibition space, which is what you can see in one of those images there, which is us enabling us for the first time to actually um, display curated treasures from our own collections and also from other um, collecting institutions and from the community. And again, we've had some, we've had Māori and Pacifica um, exhibitions in there. We've had children's book illustrations and we've got a, a, a program planned for the next year or two. Level three is our discovery floor. Uh, this is non-fiction, essentially, and it, is, um, it also has a quiet place, something, too, that the community said was important, as well as the very noisy and active spaces. Uh, you can see the um, neighbouring cathedral just peeking through the window there. So the identity and discovery floors are the more traditional floors. Thank you. Okay. And level four, so we're at the top now, um, Ahuratanga, which is creativity floor. And this is a mixture of, um, of collections, fiction collections and world language collections, uh, but it's also a lot of um, it's the maker spaces and the, um, and the virtual and augmented reality, production studio with 3D printers, laser and vinyl cutter, embroidery and sewing machines, uh, robotic equipment, and audio and video studio. And um, we're just, the, the use is just growing all the time. We are, we are delighted with the response from the community. And again, people saying, I had no idea that you could do all these things in the library, um, which is great. And there are also two garden roof terrace, uh, garden terraces, which again connect well with the environment. So 10 months on, where are we at? 10 months from opening. Um, the response has been extremely positive, And Turanga, we feel, is definitely contributing to the regeneration of the central city. From opening in October last year, we've had um, seven, probably about 800,000 people through. Uh, our target was 3,000 3, people per day, uh, and we've certainly reached that. Some, some days have been significantly higher, um, but also the central city is very much rebuilding around us, so it's a work in progress, I guess you'd say. Lots of new members, about 20,000 people have attended um, 900 programs in the building to date. And I probably need to wrap it up, actually, just about there. I have a little time lapse, but I can leave it if we're out of, out of time. What, you want me to do it? Yeah, yeah some questions, OK. Uh, actually, can I, um, it's because you've been so kind. I'll just say that one of the, um, I mean, fantastic comments. We're very busy collecting comments and reactions and testing um, with people. One of the things that people have said that's been very moving is for some people, coming into Turanga has been the first time they've come back into the central city since the earthquakes, which we were, as somebody who hasn't really left the central city, I couldn't believe that. Um, but, well, we do. We understand that for some people it's been a scary place, so um, that's just one of the things that we've learned. Now, I would need to go into... I think I need to... Sorry, I'm just... If I can, no, it's not. Okay. I can go into. Oh, sorry, Corrado. I'm just. I think it's there. So this is just a little time lapse from opening day.
Thank you, Carolyn. Very inspirational. Beautiful job. Uh, do we have questions for Carolyn? Great. Thank you. Uh, congratulations for this nice library. My question is, do you have many different cultures, so multicultural library? So, whatever you like. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Yes, uh, tr traditionally we haven't, the, the Christchurch is becoming more, more diverse culturally, so um, Māori and Pacifica communities and a number of South, Southeast Asian um, um, ethnicities as well, or cultures, uh, we have had, um, but with the rebuild of the city, it has drawn um, people in, for example, Filipino, so there's quite a high Filipino um, population or significant now so we're really that's one of the things we're really keen to do is reach out into those growing emerging um, communities and and make sure that we are actually that they know we're there and we're actually that they're using in our spaces and, and being part of, of the library community yeah 13 world languages 13 so that's what we have in the library. Sorry, that's what we have in the library, uh, in our library network. Um, th there are more. There are d more ethnicities in Christchurch, but they would be the largest. Yeah. <laughs> they, yes. Yeah. Uh, one from. One from. Louise, do you do you want me to say it, Louise? Are you going to ask a question? <laughs> Uh, kia ora, Carolyn. Um, nā mihi nui. Uh, this is a bit of a, a cheeky question, but will there, is there going to be an opportunity for people to come and visit Tūranga in the next couple of years? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a set-up job at all. Well, actually it is. <laughs> yeah. Us, provide us, all of us, with... Uh, some lightning talks from our platinum sponsors, Biblioteca and ProQuest. We asked them to give us a view from industry. Uh, so we'll have two lightning talks. The first will be uh, from Biblioteca. Not only is it one of our platinum sponsors for this year's events, but they partner with libraries around the world to enhance the library experience. Today I am pleased to introduce Maria Mayhack, who is in the standing over here, come on up. And I will introduce Sven Carlson, who is uh, uh, in the audience. Sven is the Director of Europe, Middle East and Africa. Uh, and Maria is the Portfolio Manager for Biblioteca's Open Library Solution, used in 800 libraries around the world. The focus of her role is to steer library technology development by understanding user needs and how to create better library experiences. Please welcome Maria. Is it enter or the Yes, which one is you though? Which one is yours? What's it called? Uh, it's this one. This one? No, the no. one above. That yeah. one. So Great. how do you change slides? Adjust forward. Yeah. Forward. I'll just put it, uh, put it there. And there you go. Okay, Good. lovely. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh. Um, you have to get close. Let's see if this works. Can you hear me? Okay, good. I tend to speak very loudly, so when I see a microphone, I get a little bit scared. So please just give me a little bit of a sign <laughs> if it becomes too, too loud. Uh, thank you for having us and giving us a few minutes to, to explain to you how we see these challenges from a business point of view or for the industry point of view. Biblioteca provides uh, library technology solutions uh, to, uh, globally. So um, we are here today to give you a view on how we feel library technology can be part of creating the library spaces of uh, the future. 
I am very inspired by the talks today, and I'm very happy to hear so much talk about the users, because it's definitely user needs that should be driving the library of the future. So I'm very happy to hear about uh, all the involvement you libraries are um, doing with the citizens in your area. So I'm very happy to hear that, because the modern user can be quite demanding. The modern user is out in a modern world, and they are used to getting what they want when they need it. So, they're not used to waiting, they want on-the-spot problem solving. So how can we in any way accommodate this, uh, being libraries in the world out there? We have a few uh, ideas from Bibliotheca side on how to accommodate these demanding needs from the users out there, the library users out there. So, Luckily, there is solutions for this, and at Biblioteca we have what's called open library technology that helps you extend opening hours, um, uh, unstaffed opening hours. So I'm not going too much into detail on our products today. You're more than welcome to contact us later to talk more about that. So we're just giving a brief introduction, okay? Another topic that is, of course, on the table today is spaces. It's all about the space. Now, we, today we have heard so many brilliant ideas on how to use these spaces, filling it with programs and initiatives and events. But the fact is, as many also said, these are libraries. How to create all these spaces? Where to put all these books? How to create the hands from the staffs? How to create all the, how to get all these resources? How to free hands? So at, um, these challenges, we also have some uh, solutions for. Luckily, we have we can suggest looking at smart storage, and I know Sven, who is also joining us here today, is more than happy to talk to you about that. And we also encourage you to continue looking at what self-service technology can do for your library. That's not new to most of you, but to use uh, self-service technology equipment. But it's still evolving and it's still uh, developing new uh, opportunities. So to stay on top of that, we will just encourage you to, and it will be needed in the future. Changing the perception of the library space using technology. That's a broad one, but I would like to enhance today the importance of blurring the line between the digital space and the physical space. That can mean a lot of things. Many of you also already utilize a screen. We just had Caroline telling us about this huge touch wall, creating interactions in the spaces. This is something we see increasingly. But it's also about making sure that we understand how our users out there work. Most of them walk around all the time with their smartphone, and they expect also the libraries to be able to assist them through this smartphone, because all the services they attend to in their everyday life do help them make things easier. We do have an uh, application at Biblioteca called Cloud Library, but I'll come to that. I have a couple of customer cases I would like to show you. So we will deal with that then. So, firstly, I mentioned to you the open library. At Cologne, Cologne Cult Library, Germany's Library of the Year back in 2015. They created this beautiful space designed by architect Art Voss. They really wanted to create this third space, this space that was not home, not work, but that community hub, that cultural hub and community house that the library of the future must be. To make sure that this investment was accessible uh, to the audience, to the uh, public, as much as possible, they found the Open Plus solution, Open Library, to be a great uh, economical way to do this. We, uh, when it comes to Open Plus, we're so lucky to have uh, representatives from Munich with us at this IFLA event, uh, and Roland from Munich Library is just entering, um, is just continue, starting a project with Open Plus with Biblioteca, and he has been um, volunteering to accommodate any questions any of you might have that you want to talk to a 
colleague and not biblioteca, so he's over here in the blue shirt, so thank you for that, Roland. I mentioned to you the App Cloud Library that can help blurring the line between the digital and the physical world. One thing is making sure we have digital content, um, like a possibility for downloading ebooks and audiobooks, but the app can be so much more. And what the CX Center Public Library in the US is experiencing is the opportunity now to, through the, uh, through the app and through the, the public's um, smartphones, they can now not only do these downloads, but they can also do checkouts in the library of physical uh, material. But they can also, they have this little assistant, their little tool in their phone, where they can be reminded of what books they have, when to be handed in. Also your son or daughter, if they borrowed something and it's hidden in the kinder's room, you can have a reminder on the phone. So it's extending that uh, universe of grabbing into, blurring the lines between um, the library and the private space of the library user. So I, I am very aware that we didn't have much time today. So that was a quick, brief introduction to areas we find very interesting uh, and are working on at the moment. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Maria, uh, Sven, and uh, Biblioteca for your support. Uh, I'll be talking to you about our event in just a few moments, but I do encourage you to, uh, to speak with both Sven and Maria and uh, your colleague from Munich. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll take them one-on-one -on -one at the... Thank you. Great. Uh, great. So now, uh, last but certainly not least, let me just find my, great. Our last lightning speaker for today, where is Stephen? Ah, there you are, great, great. Um, uh, from ProQuest, uh, most of you, I'm sure all of you know, ProQuest is a global higher education technology leader with diverse offerings to the academic and research sector. What makes ProQuest unique is the combination of content, technology and services, and being a trusted partner with both libraries and content providers. Uh, with us this afternoon, Stephen Hawthorne, who is VP Europe, Middle East, Africa. Uh, do you say EMEA? Yes. Oh, you do? Okay, great. Um, he has, uh, he's the VP of EMEA uh, for ProQuest with over 20 years global experience, uh, native of Northern Ireland and uh, currently based in, in the UK. So I'll turn the podium over to you, Stephen, and let's find your, your presentation. Good. Just while you're doing that, Diane, I realize uh, there's me and a short bus ride standing between you and a well-deserved drink. Um, <laughs> so we'll make sure that we keep it short. Great to be part of this group. Um, wonderful set of speakers um, and, and presentations earlier. Um, and while I don't have any inspirational videos um, to share, um, as a partner, a long-term partner of, of all of the libraries represented here, um, we take a lot of inspiration from um, everything that you're doing to uh, Im improve knowledge um, right across the world. Um, just before I start, some of the things I've taken away from the sessions this morning, and I think they're very pertinent to the way that we work um, in partnership and collaboration um, with each and every one of you. We've turned journal content, newspapers, or our library management systems. And we've been partnering with libraries like your own since 1938, when we've been developing services around microfilm, uh, e-textbooks, discovery services, and all of the themes today about maximizing your space and ensuring accessibility and visibility of your content, those are the themes that really drive what we do. And I think as we get towards 2019 and beyond, the conversations that I'm having with library directors and leaders around the world, centers around open access, 
text and data mining, visualization, and then moving into virtual reality and augmented reality. And those are things that you will start to see developing from ProQuest over the coming years. But as we've discussed, space reclamation, utilization of space is vital for you to be an accessible space for your patrons. And the feedback that we've received from, from you is the desire to move away from print, historic periodicals, dissertations, newspapers, and so on, but still preserve that content and make it accessible to all of your users. And you're partnering with ProQuest to do that. The analysis of your collections is something that we can do. We'll come into your library, we'll identify the collections that you have that are available electronically. We can preserve those collections in perpetuity, so you don't need to worry about those aspects. We have a number of different preservation techniques, and we can make that content available to your patrons or to patrons all around the world. And I think the key thing that drives us is we know that consumption of information is changing. For those of you that are dealing with, with children, with teenagers in your libraries, for those of you that have got kids around those ages, you know how they're using content in a very different way to the way that I started to use content. You know, there's a democratization of that content through Netflix, through Spotify, and so on. And the feedback that we've received from a research survey that we did with the Library Journal in one-on-one -on -one conversations with faculty with teachers points to there being more information available than ever before in more formats and in more channels. And the library of the future really has to pull all of this content together, understand how your users are utilizing that content and serve it up in a meaningful way. We also realize that research and learning is moving beyond traditional publications. Even though your students and, and patrons may not admit it, but YouTube video is absolutely key in the way that they learn and the way that they absorb information. We also know it's increasingly important for individuals, whether they're students, researchers, or any patron of your library, that they need to be seeking multiple viewpoints. All too often we've got um, individuals who are relying on one viewpoint that's served up through Facebook or served up through Twitter. And again, we are custodians of authoritative content and we can make that available to the, the patrons and users of our libraries. This is a photograph from uh, Qatar of another inspirational uh, library space, both, both inside and outside. Um, and we're, we also have a credible role, you know, from the library community and from the publisher community of ensuring that we are giving access to authoritative content to all of our users and so that we can move away from uh, you know, this trending topic of fake news. So what I want to leave you with really is that ProQuest has been a long-term partner with everyone in this room and all of your colleagues since 1938. We continue to partner with you, but we take inspiration from everything that you're learning from your patrons. And I did just want to leave you with one case study. Um, this is one out of many. It's the University of Southern California. We partnered with them. We did the assessment and the analysis that we, we, we talked about earlier. They had an incredibly large collection of unused print materials and they wanted to meet the needs of their users by creating innovative collaboration spaces. They worked with our experts at ProQuest on the digitization, the indexing and the curation of that content, not only to make it available to all of their patrons on site, but where relevant that we could serve that up to users all around the world. And that we could provide insights into how that content was being used and where that content was being used. And they've been able to free up a lot of that space that was taken up by print collections in wonderful collaboration and innovative spaces. So on that, I think we're bang on time for you to get your coaches and for us to have a, a well-deserved glass of wine this evening. So thank you. <laughs> Just a, uh, 
logistic notice um, due to city regulations uh, of bus and coaches traffic um, we cannot take the coaches right here but we have to make something like a six seven minutes walk sorry about that but <laughs> grab your uh, last energies <laughs> Don't go away. Patience. Don't go away. I just want to wrap up and say thank you sincerely to all of our amazing speakers today. Uh, we're, we'll carry on the discussion at our reception. We will talk to you on the bus about an extra special feature that we're providing, which is tours of the uh, Museum of Modern Art. So we'll talk to you on the bus and we'll go through that then. Uh, but I think we need to know where to go to get the bus. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll show you, I'll show you. <laughs> we'll sh you will, two or three people will show you. Other people will show you? Yeah. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to be shown. Uh, let's follow Corrado and we'll see you on the bus.